Tonight we're in chapter 17 here in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at the entire chapter. It basically deals with a parable, with a riddle. And, uh, you know, as I prepared this study, I can tell you this, and I'll introduce our study by saying this, and that the first 21 verses of chapter 17 basically give to us a parable and then give to us uh, basic some in, basically some interpretation. It's going to be very difficult for me to handle this because the first 10 verses I'm going to be explaining uh, basically as we go through it to the degree that when we look at verses 11 through 21, it's almost a repetition. And so at that point what I'm going to do is pull out a couple of things that, that I hadn't already spoken of and then develop that and then move on and conclude the chapter. And so um, I don't know how long it's going to take for me to do this. I told Mike, I said, I think I could really do this in about 10 minutes. So uh, because cause I could. <laughs> but I'm going to do the best that I can to give you as much as I can and bring this to a, a place where where it's worth us coming tonight to get this study. So let's begin reading here in uh, chapter 17 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 10. We'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. And say, Thus says the Lord God, A great eagle with large wings and long pinions, full of feathers of various colors, came to Lebanon and took from the cedar the highest branch. He cropped off its topmost young twig and carried it to the land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants. Then he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. He placed it by abundant waters and set it like a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature. Its branches turned toward him, but its roots were under it. So it became a vine, brought forth branches, put forth shoots. But there was another great eagle with large wings and many feathers, and behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and stretched its branches toward him from the garden terrace where it had been planted, that he might water it. It was planted in good soil by many waters, to bring forth branches, bear fruit, and become a majestic vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots, cut off its fruit, and leave it to wither? All of its spring leaves will wither, and no great power or many people will be needed to pluck it up by its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind touches it? It will wither in the garden terrace where it grew. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> Neither do I. Um, as we begin, some very basic things here. Notice with me that this, this new word from the Lord is referred to in two ways. One, it's a riddle, and two, it's a parable. And, and that's what, how he begins. He says, son of, man, son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable. Now, a riddle. A riddle is one of those puzzling questions that need to be solved or guessed. That's what a riddle is. A parable is literally placing one thing besides another thing in order to draw a comparison between the two. When you get into the New Testament, Jesus very often spoke in parables. And what a parable was intended to do was it was intended to hide from those who were not interested truth, but cause those who are interested to pursue it in order to understand it. So Jesus very often would speak in parables because the lazy listeners who were not really inclined towards or feeling anything religious will say. Once they heard the parable, they would just walk away and say, this doesn't really matter. It's not worth thinking about. But other people who would hear the parables of Jesus would say, this is something worth pursuing. I'd like to know its meaning. What is it saying? Now, when Jesus would use parables, he would, he would be giving earthly illustrations 
but he would be bringing heavenly truth through those illustrations. And so, in this particular portion of Scripture, what you have is a puzzle. You have something that needs to be looked at. You have a parable, a heavenly truth couched in earthly wisdom or earthly illustration. And that's what he's speaking about here as he's speaking concerning these two eagles. Now, what it's going to deal with is going to be dealing with, with uh, Judah's relationship with these two eagles. These eagles are actually representing two great nations. One nation that's being represented is Babylon. The other nation being represented is Egypt. We'll see that very clearly in just a moment. And so that's what we'll be looking at. Let's look at this together. He speaks in verse 3 in this way. He says, Thus says the Lord God, A great eagle with large wings, long pinions, full of feathers of various colors, came to Lebanon and took from the cedar the highest branch. And so he's speaking concerning one of these eagles. This eagle here represents Babylon, the king of Babylon. This would represent Nebuchadnezzar who invaded Israel. He speaks of these large wings and he refers to long pinions. Now, I didn't know what pinions were. How many of you know what pinions are? I'm really interested. Some of you, do. I had no clue what a pinion was. I know what opinions are, but I didn't have a clue what pinions were. I had to look that up. What are pinions? They're the long feathers at the end of the wing there that helps them to fly. And what he's speaking concerning here as he's using this particular, this illustration of an eagle, one, we know an eagle is a noble animal, and thus an eagle is representing a king. And the large wings and the long pinions or outer feathers will speak of power and it speaks of dominion. Now, this is speaking about Babylon. When you look in the book of Daniel, in chapter 2, and you look at verses 37 and 38, Daniel is speaking in that passage to the king of Babylon, a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And as he's speaking to him, he's speaking concerning the immensity of the Babylonian empire. And he was speaking in that passage concerning how it was the most powerful empire on the face of the earth. And he says there in Daniel 2, 37 and 38, he says, You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar represented the most powerful kingdom on the face of the earth. And so that's what these large wings and long pinions are referring to. It's Nebuchadnezzar, the nation of Babylon, that is the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Now, it's interesting how he speaks of feathers because when he speaks concerning these feathers here, it's interesting how he puts it. He says, full of feathers of various colors. Well, that would refer to the fact that Babylon had a lot of, of uh, nations that were sub submitted to them. It speaks concerning the lands, the various lands that had come under subjection. That's what the people represent. The many colors speaks of the variety of people under Babylonian rule. He speaks concerning coming to Lebanon and taking from the cedar of the highest, cedar, the highest branch. Well, Lebanon is where the cedar came for the temple and the palace. And so that would represent Judah. He is speaking concerning the king of Babylon who's going to come to Judah and is going to do something. He is actually going to take the king of Judah captive. That's the point that he's making there. And that's what happened in history. If you take notes, you can see this in 2 Kings 24, verse 15, where the king of Babylon carried Je Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. Well, he goes on in verses 5 and 6, and he says, he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. Nebuchadnezzar replaced Jehoiachin with a king by the name of Zedekiah. And he replaced the king with another Jewish man, thus he didn't bring in a foreign ruler. And so the conditions originally surrounding him were favorable. They weren't harsh. That's why it's spoken of in this way, fertile and abundant water. For the first few years, he ruled with no problems from Babylon. As a vassal to Nebuchadnezzar, Judah prospered and was at peace. But in verse 7, there was another great eagle with large wings and many feathers. Behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and stretched its branches toward him from the garden terrace where it had been planted, that he might water it. 
It was planted in good soil by many waters to bring forth branches, bear fruit, and become a majestic vine. Verses 7 and 8 introduce the second eagle. The second eagle is Egypt. And what happened was Egypt at that time was ruled by a pharaoh. His name was Hophra, and he began his rule in 588, according to Jeremiah 4430. So in order to overthrow Babylonian rule, what happens is Zedekiah turns to Egypt and asks help from them. Now, Jeremiah, the prophet who was also living during the time of Ezekiel, actually had warned them against making an alliance with Egypt. It says in Jeremiah 37, 5 through 8, Pharaoh's army came up from Egypt when the Chaldeans or the Babylonians who were besieging Jerusalem heard news of them. They departed from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help you, will return to Egypt, to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. And so this eagle that's introduced to us in verse 7, this second eagle is Egypt. And it also is a massive empire that is coming alongside of Israel to support them in opposition to Babylon. And so that's what's taking place. So Judah could have remained at peace had it not allied with Egypt is what is being said here. And then in verses 9 and 10, the question is asked, will it thrive? Well, the answer is no. It's not going to survive because God is going to bring, bring judgment on Judah through Babylon. Now, he's already been saying that. Well, he was going to bring judgment from the north. And so once again, he's saying, look, no matter what you're doing and no matter how hard you're trying to get out from underneath the judgment, and even when you go out and you try to get some help, you try to get the Egyptians to come alongside of you, the bottom line is you're not going to make it. The bottom line is I'm going to judge you. I'm judging you because of your idolatry. I'm judging you because of your ungodly kings. I am bringing judgment. And that's what's been taking place, and that's the purpose of this particular parable. God is saying that's going to take place, and there's nothing you can do about it. So reading on into verse 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, do you not know what these things mean? Tell them. Indeed, the king of Babylon went to Jerusalem and took its king and princes and led them with him to Babylon. That's King Jehoiachin. And he took the king's offspring, made a covenant with him, and put him under oath. He also took away the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be brought low and not lift itself up. But that by keeping his covenant, it might stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and many people. Will he prosper? Will he who does such things escape? Can he break a covenant and still be delivered? As I live, says the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. Nor will Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company do anything in the war when they heap up a siege bound and build a wall to cut off many persons. Since he despised the oath by breaking the covenant and in fact gave his hand and still did all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath which he despised, my covenant which he broke, I'll recompense on his own head. I will spread my net over him. He shall be taken in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, try him there for treason, which he committed against me. All his fugitives with all his troops shall fall by the sword. Those who remain shall be scattered to every wind. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. Well, seeing that we've been looking at the interpretation of the parable up to this point. Let me give you a couple of things that I think are very practical, and then I'm going to move into something that I think that the Lord really placed on my heart for this evening's Bible study. But let me give you a couple of things here about this. One, in verses 16 and 17, King Zedekiah is being referred to here. I mentioned him earlier in the earlier verses. King Zedekiah is going to die. And the reason uh, this is going to take place, he's going to be dealt with, is because he looked to Egypt for help and Egypt cannot help him. He's going to be taken captive, and he's going to die in captivity. Now, the thing that's interesting we need to remember 
is as he was doing this, as he was looking to Egypt for help, Egypt during that time was famous. It was famous and had been for centuries, by the way, for its chariots and for its horses. Egypt was famous for chariots and for horses. And what happened is the king of, of Judah at that time, King Zedekiah, made a decision. His decision was, I'm going to trust in, in the military strength of Egypt. Even though he had made a covenant that he would uh, be a vassal to uh, Babylon, he tried to find a way of getting out from underneath that. Now, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had him swear an oath to God, to the God of Israel, that he would remain loyal to him, in subjection to him. And as a result of that, Israel was actually prospering, if you will, under the hand of the Babylonian king. But Zedekiah didn't want to be underneath him. He wanted to be broken away from that. He wanted to have freedom once again. And so, in order to secure freedom, he lied in his covenant to God and he trusted in the hand of flesh. He trusted in the Egyptians. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 20, this is a great verse, Psalm 20, verse 7 says this, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some people trust in military strength. We trust in the God of the universe. And there needs to be this mentality of trusting in God first. Like the psalmist in Psalm 121 says in verses 1 and 2, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Zedekiah forgot that his help comes from God when he began to trust in horses and chariots. And that's what he did. He gave himself over to making an agreement with Egypt, asking Egypt to help them that they might throw off the yoke of bondage that had been put on them by Babylon. God had already warned them through Jeremiah and said, don't go that route. They did it anyway. So as a result of that, King Zedekiah is going to be dealt with. A second thing, notice verse 20. God says, I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, try him there for the treason which he committed against me. Now, as I mentioned, Zedekiah took an oath of loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar and he broke it. In 2 Chronicles 36, 13, it says, Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear an oath by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against uh, turning to the Lord God of Israel. And God says, you have stiffened your neck, you've hardened your heart, you won't turn to me, and I see that as treasonous because you're rebelling against the promise you made in God's name. And that's why judgment came upon him. It says in 2 Kings 24, verses 6 and 7, they took Zedekiah, brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah. They pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. And he remained in Babylon until the day of his death, according to Jeremiah 52, verse 11. Can you imagine that? The last thing that this king saw, the last thing that his eyes ever recorded for his memory was the death of his own sons. That's the cruelty that was taking place during that day. They forced him to watch the execution of his own children. That's the last thing his eyes ever focused on. And then they put out his eyes and they kept him in captive, captivity until the day that he died. He had people who were loyal to him, according to verse 21, but they ultimately were scattered they were killed or they were scattered, and the kingdom at that time was shaken up to its core. And that's why the Lord says, all his fugitives with all his troops shall fall by the sword, and those who remain shall be scattered to every wind, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. But God doesn't leave them in that way. Notice, and this is what I want to share some things with you about here. Notice verse 22 through 24. Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar, set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one and will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. 
on the mountain height of Israel. I will plant it, and it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. In the shadow of its branches they will dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree, made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. This is a messianic prophecy. This is related to Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, the Messiah of the world. And what God is saying is this, through my grace, by my grace, I'm going to raise up a branch out of a high cedar. Now, this high cedar, this branch and this high cedar represent the house of David because it's to his house that this promise was originally made. In Jeremiah, in chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. The branch is another title of Messiah. And so what we have here is God making a promise and that he's going to bring, he says in verse 22, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. This is a picture of Jesus who is the branch. This is what is called a messianic prophecy. Now, King David, I want to talk to you a little bit about him. He was named after me. Now, King David, very few people know that. David. King David was at rest. Second Samuel 7 tells us this. David was at rest. And he began to start thinking about how God had blessed his life. He began to think about all the things that the Lord had done, but he especially began to think about the fact that he lived in a very nice place. He lived in what we would call a palace, a palace that was built out of the cedars of Lebanon. David's home that he lived in was a mansion. And as he began to think about it, living there in luxury, living in the lap of luxury, David began to think concerning God and the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was, uh, was symbolic of the place that God said that he would meet with the nation of Israel, but the Ark of the Covenant did not have a permanent temple. The Ark of the Covenant was in a tent, a portable tent called the tabernacle. And as King David was there relaxing in luxury, he began to think out loud and he spoke to a prophet by the name of Nathan. And he said to Nathan, it's just not right. It's not right that I should live in ease when the ark of God is in a tent with curtains. It just isn't right. And he says, I want to build a temple, a magnificent temple, a place where we can place the ark of the covenant there that is absolutely gorgeous, it's beautiful, because... God, who is the, the creator of all things, deserves the very best thing that we can give to him. I want to build him a temple. Well, Nathan the prophet, who is listening to David, is stirred by what David says. You see, the Bible speaks concerning David's heart, how it was after the Lord. And, and as Nathan is listening to, to David speak, Nathan just speaks back to David. He says, do what's in your heart. The Lord is with you. Let's build a temple for God. Well, after he says that as a temp, as a, rather a prophet representing God to David, God speaks to Nathan. And he says, listen, I haven't asked for this to be done. I've never requested a temple to be built. God was saying through Nathan who went and spoke to David, I'm perfectly content in the things as they are. And David, I've never commanded you to enter into such a project. But God was moved by the love that David had for him. God was moved that David's heart was so right in the matter that he would actually think, I live better than God, if you will. 
I've got all of this around me, and he's in a tent with walls that are basically simply curtains. That moved the Lord. That this one would think he was living off too well and God himself didn't have a place that was giving him glory. And as this has taken place, God is moved by the heart of David. But God, though he's moved by David's heart to honor him, instead desires to honor David. And he begins to speak and he says, listen, he says, I sought you out, I selected you, while you were still just a young shepherd. And I took you from the sheepfold as you were watching your father's sheep, and I set you up as the king over the nation of Israel. Not only that, but as a military commander, I always went before you. I ensured that you had victories, and I'm the one who brought fame to you. I've done all of these things because, David, you were a man after my own heart. And I took you from being just a youth watching the sheep. I made you a king. I brought you into a place of being a champion. And I made you absolutely famous. And not only that, but I want to give you a greater honor. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. God says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He says in verse 16 of the same chapter, your house, your kingdom shall be established forever before you your throne shall be established forever. Now, he's not speaking specifically of Solomon, though we'll look at that in just a moment. There's a greater son from the line of Judah, the Messiah. That's the one who will rule and reign forever. Now, God is saying to him, I'm going to honor you. Now, this is something that spoke to my heart today. Even as I've already mentioned more than once, David is a man after God's own heart. But when you read the Bible account of David, you see that he was also a man of the flesh and he had absolute inconsistencies. We know him very well as a, a man who had a deep passion for God. This is a man who had a tremendous zeal for God. But this was a man who gave over to his own passions on occasion. But this is a man who had a passion for the Lord. As a matter of fact, one of the more interesting scriptures that David penned, Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22, listen to this. This is David, the man after God's own heart. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. God what you hate, I hate. The one you love, I love. What an incredible passion this man had for the Lord. Your enemies are my enemies. David, as we look at him, as we have been on Sunday mornings and we've been getting glimpses of him as we go through 1 Samuel, David's a man of courage. David's a man of conviction. He's a man of zeal and intensity, a man of vision and charisma. This is a man of faith in God. In every way possible, as we study the life of David, he's a man's man, heroic beyond proportion. There's nobody like him. He was a small-town shepherd willing to take on a giant because of his zeal and his love for God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Is the way he spoke of Goliath. We saw that. Who is he to defy the armies of the living God? David. And David said, I want to build God a house. I want to give him a house that is, has got splendor and beauty, something that's incredible because my God is incredible. It's in my heart to build God a temple. I want to build him a temple. But God says, no, you can't. 
It's interesting. David had a desire to build a house for the Lord, but God denied him that privilege. And God even tells us why. David did not build the house for the Lord. Solomon built the house for the Lord. David didn't. David had a heart that was perfect towards the Lord. But God said, you cannot build me a house. And we find out why in 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 and 8. Because there David said to his son Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. You've been a man of war, a man of blood. My temple is going to be built by a man of peace. And so Solomon was the one who built the house. David's son Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 8 and 9 said this. He said, The Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well in that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple in my name. Now, David never built that temple. But you know what? He still supplied the plans and he supplied finances for its building. You see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and 29. But God's promise is a messianic promise. And that's what we're seeing in these verses here. God is saying, I'm going to give to you something. I'm going to bring to you Messiah. That's what he's saying in verse 22 when he says, I will also... I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. We'll plant it on a high and prominent mountain. He's speaking of Messiah who's going to come from the line of, uh, of Judah, from the tribe of Judah. He's speaking of Messiah and the promises that this Messiah, one of the names of Messiah is the branch. When he says, on the mountain height of Israel, I'll plant it and will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. He's speaking concerning Jesus and his ministry. You see, God is renewing his promise to this nation. He's saying, listen, though you're in exile, you are going to be restored because I'm going to send my servant, the branch. The Messiah will come and he will establish his kingdom. He will rule and he will reign. It's interesting how in verse 23 it says, under it will dwell birds of every sort, in the shadow of its branches, they will dwell. The message of Messiah is for all ma mankind, not certain ethnic groups and no, not certain nationalities. We see when the Lord Jesus Christ had been resurrected and he was there giving marching orders to, to his disciples, and we see this in, in uh, the four Gospels as well as the book of Acts, we see the commission being given to them. We see that the Lord Jesus Christ commands them. He says, go out into all the world and make disciples. Go out into all the world and, and bring them to the point where they understand the A to the Z of what the message of the gospel is. He said, go out and speak to them and teach them in my name. And he said, declare to them all the things that I have commanded you. That's one of the reasons why we in this fellowship take the time to try and read through chapters, understand them book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's why we do that, because the Lord taught us to go through the Word of God. There are a lot of people who aren't interested in things of God. They're not interested in the Word of God. They're not interested in it at all. But Jesus Christ said, listen, if you're going to be a disciple, you need to be able to know the A to the Z of my Word. That's how you're going to understand the things of God. That's how you're going to know the ways of God. That's why when Paul was speaking to the Ephesian elders there in the book of Acts chapter 20, he said, I have not shunned to declare unto you the entire counsel of God. I've told you everything from the A to the Z. I have prepared you. I have developed you. I have mentored you. I have equipped you. I gave you everything you need to know the ways of the Lord. That's my goal, by the way, as pastor of this church. One of these days, the Lord is going to take me home, and I want to be able to go home with the knowledge that I did my best to give you the A to the Z through the Word of God. I was talking to some young men at a baptism, and they were... Um, they were here for the baptism but didn't normally attend our fellowship. And, and so as we were speaking, they said, uh, Pastor David, I'd like to ask you a question. And I, I said, of course. This young man said, 
I'm considering what fellowship I'm supposed to be attending, and I wanted to know your advice. Can you help me? Can you help me to make a decision based on, you know, my desire to know which church I should go to? I'm going to this particular church, but I also go to other churches, and I, I'm wanting to find a place to, to go that, that I can plant my you know, plant, be planted in and, and, and grow in. What would you recommend? And, and I'll tell you what I told him. I said, well, let's just put it this way. You need, you need to get the Word of God A to Z. You need to. I said, and the way to know if you are or not is, is this. I say, say you go to church on a Sunday and the pastor says, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John. And we're going to be looking at chapter 1, and we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, or 1 through 13 this morning. I said, after you come out of that Bible study, you should have the ability, or at least the notes, to be able to look at all 13 of those verses and make comment on each one of them. You should be able to do that. You should be able to say this verse means this, this verse means this, this verse means this, and this verse means this. That's how you know if you're being taught the Word of God because you can go to church, they can open up and read the book to you, and then they launch off into whatever it is they feel like speaking about for 45 minutes, and then they return, and off you go. You didn't learn that passage. What you ended up is you ended up hearing his favorite speech for the moment. And the way to determine whether you're being taught the Word of God is can you go back to that passage later on and look at the verses and can you know these things? Who is this eagle here? Who is the eagle there? What, what was his name? Things like that. Can you do that? That's how you know whether you're being taught the Word of God or not. Now, a lot of people don't really care for that because for them, I think church is something else. I think for them, going to church or a Bible study is really more a form of entertainment. Let's face it, especially a younger generation that is used to watching a lot of movies with a lot of... Lot of uh, a lot of action and all. I didn't see, I haven't seen, and I'm not planning on seeing because I've heard reviews on the latest Transformers movie. But I saw the first one. I've had to because it plays in my house all the time. Marie loves it. No, she doesn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Optimus Prime. Um, My kids, when they were young, when they had Transformers on TV as a show, and they used to have those little Transformer toys 20 years ago or whenever, I don't even know, over 20 years ago. When you watched those Transformer programs back then, corny, corny. But, you know, we'd get them, especially David and Joseph, we got them those little cars that would turn into little, you know, figures and all of that. And, and so I go to see Transformers. I saw Transformers, and I'm blown away. I'm blown away by all the noise and all the, you know, the excitement in the first movie, Transformers. And I'm saying, man, this is amazing. The way they did this, the graphics, unbelievable action. All of that noise, all of the quick changes, the rapid scenes, it, 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 gets, you, it gets you hyped up for as long as... And then you end up kind of like, whoa, you know, that was quite an experience. That's entirely different than over 20 years ago when you kind of watch these stick figure things, you know. <laughs> Times have changed. I mean, they're talking today concerning, you know, how the iPod has taken the place of the Walkman. I was watching the news on that today. And the first Walkmans, you know, 20 or how many years ago, cost like 350 bucks. And they were just, you'd put your cassettes in it and you'd, I still remember those. They were very expensive. And now this high-tech stuff that we have, you know, you got your iPhone, and, and, and you can create your own radio stations on that, Pandora and various others. And you can select whatever you want. It's just an amazing thing. And it's everything that we have today is sped up so much over the last 10 to 20 years that it's unbelievable. I think people see church like that. I think they come to see the pastor's head spin a few times or something. <laughs> For entertainment. You get that in The Exorcist, but you don't get that here. 
guacamole everywhere. You know, I really do. I really think that entertainment is God. I believe that. Entertainment is God. And a lot of people don't understand that in order for us to grow in the things of the Lord, we have to have a more sure knowledge of what reality actually is, and we find that from God's Word. Because, listen, we believe in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as believers, we believe in Him. But there is a lineage that goes all the way back in the Old Testament that we have to pursue to understand that we have our faith resting in history, resting in accurate historical fact related to the promises God made in the Old Testament all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, and following through over 300 specific prophecies related to Messiah. That's what our faith rests on. So David, a young shepherd boy, is taken from the field. He's made king, replacing a king out of the tribe of Benjamin because God's intention is to bring Messiah through Judah. And David is from the tribe of Judah. David is given a promise by God because David said, I want to build you a temple. God says, what you wanted to do is great. You can't do it. You're a man of blood. Your son Solomon will do it. But inasmuch as you wanted to build me a house, David, I want to tell you I'm building you one. Your line is going to continue because Messiah Jesus, the son of David, came out of the tribe of Judah. And when we take this message throughout the world, we are basically saying to every person, no matter what nation, you can have a relationship with God through Jesus Messiah. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. The body of Christ is not made up of only one ethnic or national group. The body of Christ is made up of any human being who opens their heart to the glorious message of the gospel, embraces Jesus Christ, and becomes born again. We don't select our brothers and we don't select our sisters. God does. And he brings them into the family and he makes us one with him. And so this was not just a Middle Eastern religion that was supposed to be centered in the nation of Israel because Jesus said, go out into all the world and make disciples. He said, you shall receive power after that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Take this message out so that under, the, under, under Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ will dwell birds of every sort. Salvation is intended for all mankind. You see, when you get to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, it says, When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. That's the body of Christ. That which was rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's what he's saying. All the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low. He was despised and he was rejected. He was esteem, lightly esteemed. People didn't want him. But the Bible says that he came unto his own and his own didn't know him, didn't receive him. But to those who received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name. Came unto his own, they rejected him. But to those who received him, they're the ones who become sons of God. 
That's where this message, that's why this message is so important because it's a message of salvation. So God is telling the nation of Israel, listen, you've got a couple of kings that I'm going to have to deal with, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah. Jehoiachin's going to go into captivity. Zedekiah is going to make a covenant with Egypt. Jeremiah is going to warn him against it, but he's going to do it anyway. Babylon's going to come and lay siege to Jerusalem. Zedekiah is going to be taken captive. He's going to be judged. He had made an oath to me that he would remain in, under, under the authority of Babylon, but he's going to reject that oath. He's going to be judged. I'm going to treat him as a traitor because it was treasonous what he did, making an oath like that and rejecting it. His sons are going to be put to death in front of him. He's going to be blinded, and he's going to remain in Babylonian captivity until the day of his death. But I want you to know that captivity doesn't last forever because Messiah is going to be given to the nation of Israel and Jewish people as well as the rest of the world will open their hearts to him and will rest under him because of my grace, my love, and my mercy. See, I told you I could say it in 10 minutes. <laughs>